um, uh, in, in, in my day, um, which goes back to the 20th century, I don't know how many of my, your viewers go back to the 20th century, but um, then uh, manuscripts were submitted. First of all, you pitch them over the telephone, which nobody does anymore. Uh, everything is by email or text. Um, uh, uh, if somebody wanted to see the manuscript, you would put it in a box. We had a closet filled with manuscript sized boxes. You would put it in a box and either air, either mail it or give it to a messenger service who would bike it across the city. That is how uh, things got submitted. And if somebody wanted to make an offer, he would actually, or she would call you on the telephone um, and you would negotiate over the telephone. Another thing, which is not only not done anymore, it is forbidden because there were so many misunderstandings that arose out of telephone negotiations where I wrote down one thing and you wrote down something else that they finally, uh, publishers basically now all have a condition that any offer you make is going to be by email. And so there's no mistaking. So those, that's, a, that's a ride back into the 20th century. Um, and it was, it was fun, but uh, it's, it's a completely bygone era. Yeah. So in those days, if, if you were going to pass on a manuscript after you read it, you had to call up the author and tell them you were passing? Uh, well, you would call up for their agent. No, you you no. In fact, uh, most of the time you would get a rejection letter. Ah. Um, again, if for those who don't know what a letter is, you would open up uh, <laughs> the mail and find hopefully not just a printed rejection slip, but but some encouraging word written in ink from the editor um, that would you would. You would read 50 times, hoping that uh, you would find some magical formula in that letter that would encourage you to go on with your career. Right. Got it. Cool. So, Richard, you've, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've had over 50 books published and a number of plays that you've written staged and performed. And uh, t tell me about your, your writing career and also how different is it writing for play versus a book? Well, um, remember that I wanted to be a novelist um, or at least a, a writer, but I was working in a literary agency and making a decent living. Um, uh, and one of the things the agency did was package short stories for confession magazines. Really? So um, uh, every month they would, deliver a uh, file, a folder filled with short stories uh, written by their clients for maybe $25, $50 uh, each. And one day I said, can I, can I try one of those? Uh, and they said, sure. And I wrote it. And my first story was the, con the confession story was, the formula was sin, suffer, and repent. Um, and they were very popular in those days. And my first short story was, my smashed body made me a tramp. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and I, th I, can't, I think I got $25 for that. So um, when I, I started writing stories and um, I also got an opportunity to write Pulp Fiction when the agency was packaging, believe it or not, dirty books. Um, <laughs> in those days, dirty books were far milder than the mildest erotic fiction written today. Oh, yeah. Um, you couldn't use dirty words. You couldn't use anatomical words. Everything was metaphors and, and uh, uh, words that, you know, suggest the words. So I wrote seven of those. And many years later, collectors collecting those books came to me and, and basically said that I was a star in, the, in this field. Um, 
That's great. So, you know, uh, when I left the agency, I became a freelance writer um, and I wrote fiction, nonfiction, children's, adult, um, anything that anybody wanted, I wrote. Um, I wrote everything from real pulp uh, to a serious book uh, about the dangers of nuclear power plants, which wow. became a bestseller and a very controversial book. Um, and um, so I did that for several years um, uh, until the uh, agency, uh, uh, I had left the agency as a freelance writer and a number of former clients asked me uh, if I would take them back and represent them. Um, so they had left the agency I'd worked for and asked me as a, as a favor to handle them again. So for several years, I was like an agent in the morning and a writer in the afternoon. Um, and literally, and I had two desks to keep myself um, segregated from corrupting each, each of these two careers. I literally had desks um, back to back. I would face East to be an agent and West to, to, be, a, to be a writer. It's great. Um, and after several years of that, I discovered that I could make more money uh, on commissions on one sale than I could make writing a whole novel. Um, so little by little, I was kind of sucked back into the agency business and finally set up my own agency, uh, incorporated in 1979, um, which will give you some idea of my advanced age. Um, and um, over time, we became, I'd say, one of the leading agencies uh, in, in the business. But I never stopped writing. And in 1980, um, I began writing a column for Locus, the science fiction publication, a uh, science fiction newsletter. I wrote a, uh, a newsletter uh, for the newsletter. I wrote about how to read a contract. And I wrote about all the things that writers needed to know to, 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 to understand the, the publishing business and how to conduct them. So everything from an analysis of every clause of a contract to what is this new business called eBooks? Um, uh, or what happens at a publishing convention? Or uh, how should you behave when an editor takes you to lunch? Um, so those columns were collected into several, uh, several books that were subsequently published. And I dare say that probably 90% of the advice that I gave in those books is still is still valid. Um, well, I believe that. <laughs> right. So even uh, so, that brings us into the '80s, and in the late 1980s, I saw something very strange. I saw a CD-ROM disc, and I was amazed um, at how much it could carry by way of of literary work. Now, I walked around like a lot of people listening on a, what I think was called a Walkman, which right. was basically a, a portable audio that you could load with music. Um, and I saw one of these <clears throat> CD-ROM discs <clears throat> and I said, why couldn't there be a, uh, a technology where you take one of these discs and insert it into a light box and read it as a book. Now remember, there was no internet. So that was rather my primitive idea of how you would read an ebook. You insert a disc in there and read it. So I became certain that, the, that this was going to become a viable technology. And um, in the 90s, uh, when it became very clear 
that this was going to happen. There were rudimentary websites selling digitized short stories. They were awful, but of course, everything digital was awful in those days. Um, but in anticipation that this might happen, I began recovering the rights to hundreds and hundreds of out of print books by my clients, wow. romance, romance, thriller, science fiction. And the publishers had no idea what was what this was about. And they had to give me the rights back because they couldn't keep a book in print that was completely off sale. Right. There were no copies left in the warehouse. So as, as we approached the end of the 90s, I had hundreds and hundreds of books in, in inventory. Um, and uh, I told my clients, my authors, that this was going to happen. And when it does, we'll be ready for the technology. Uh, in 1998, um, the revolution hit. Two things happened that year. It was really a watershed year uh, in the publishing industry. Uh, in 1998, the first ebook reader was released. Um, it was called um, the, what was it called? I'm looking at my watch because it was called, I can't remember now, but I have a watch that was given me as a souvenir. Oh, it's called the Rocket Book. Oh uh, yeah, uh, I remember that. Well, here is the rocket in oh, my yeah. watch, which I still wear. <laughs> um, so it's the Rocket Book and it was rather a crude technology, but for the first time you could buy a device and download books. That same year, the first print on demand printing press was, I won't say perfected, but was developed to the point where you could print books on demand. So that was 1998. And I said, this is a signal to come out of the stable and start running. So rather than be an agent handling all these books, I just started decided to start a publishing company. Um, and so I started a company called eReads and it was the first, I, I'm fairly certain this is true. It was the first um, uh, ebook publishing company, commercial ebook publishing company in the English language. Wow. Um, uh, but um, unfortunately, there was no business model. Um, nobody, I mean, the technology was still primitive. Um, uh, the, the books were not converted into any kind of viable text. They had to be converted from printed books to uh, e-books. Um, uh, there was no business model. Nobody knew how much to charge. Nobody knew what kind of royalty to pay. Um, so. I, I actually, if I say so myself, pioneered in creating a business model, many facets of which are still um, still used today. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story, which I probably shouldn't tell publicly, but um, in, the, in, the, in the mid eighties, I was the president of the Agents Association and I told all the agents uh, that they better gear up for the coming revolution. Um, and I said, the most important thing is that the royalty we should be demanding as agents is 50% of uh, on digital, on eBooks. Um, so when I started my eBook company, uh, I was dedicated to paying a 50% royalty. But I looked at the business model I created and I said, how the hell am I going to make money <laughs> giving 50% to those, those authors, those lousy authors? <laughs> so I, I did figure out how to do it, but I, I was kind of hoist on my own petard as I said. <laughs> um, so I had the ebook company for some 15 years before it was acquired. And um, uh, we started the ebook company in around 2000, 
And it wasn't until 2007 that the Kindle was introduced. Right. So essentially, we were selling ebooks on all these precursors of the Kindle and barely making, in fact, I was losing money. Wow. Um, but I knew that sooner or later, someone was going to come along with something that ended up being called a Kindle. Um, and that's when, that's when the revolution not only hit for us, but right. it hit for the entire publishing industry. Cool. That's a long answer to a very short question. Well, that was a great answer. And I learned a lot in that answer. So thank you. Let, let's go back to your writing for a second, though. So when did you get into writing plays? And uh... All right, well, so um, uh, I was I was a literary agent. And the only writing I did, and I say only with an asterisk, because I wrote ton, I wrote blogs, I wrote emails, I wrote reports, um, I wrote articles. I was a very prolific writer while I was a, a publisher and, and, and while I was a literary agent. Um, right. But sometime, I can't remember, in, in the late 90s, um, I, uh, we we bought or we, we bought an apartment and there was a closing on the apartment have you ever closed had a close been to a closing buying or selling yes more than once <laughs> it's a very very complex and scary thing because you have the bank you have the the buyer the seller all the lawyers um uh, all the interests gather around the table to basically pass around documents and checks. And, um, and if one thing goes wrong, the whole thing can unravel right there in the room. Yeah. And so at a, at a closing that we attended, something went wrong. Oh. And it began to unravel. And only through the skill and brilliance of my attorney, was the closing rescued and we finally we finished the closing but i said to myself one day i'm going to write a play about a closing that goes wrong and i just tucked that into my head and tucked it away for maybe a decade or longer maybe 10 or 15 years until one day the i figured out how the play would be written or what, what I needed to write that play. Basically, it had to be that everybody in the room knows each other from before. Okay. And that created not just a funny gimmick, but relationships, um, including a divorced couple. Uh, he's, giving, he's giving the apartment as part of a divorce settlement to his former wife um, for $1. And, and, and the shit hits the fan, let's just put it that way. Um, so I, I wrote it um, and that kind of got me into writing plays. I loved writing plays and I wish I had known when I was 20 as a writer, what I learned decades later um, because I, I could have been a contender. Um, but of course, you know, when you're mature, you might be a better writer than you were when you were 20. Um, so I wrote these plays and some of them were performed off off Broadway. Um, and one of them was performed, the, the play about the closing was performed in about four or five years ago uh, and it was brilliantly done. Um, what I learned from writing plays that you don't learn from writing novels or books right. was, econo was economy. Um, uh, you cannot get, first of all, the transition from writing literarily to writing, uh, as, writing as a playwright is vast. It's basically taking all the he says, she says, taking out all the dark and stormy night, um, uh, and all you're left with is stage directions and people talking to each other. Right. 
Right. Now remember, I'm still a literary agent and I'm applying the lessons of a playwright to the guidance I'm giving to authors. Um, and, and it enabled me to understand how verbose and overblown so much fiction was um, and uneconomical to say the least. And by the way, the reason why has to do with, e with, with uh, digital word processing. People write books on their word processors, right. whether it's Word or whatever it may be. And because they're not looking at a pile of paper, but basically one long file, they lose complete track of their text. And they wake up with a manuscript 150 to 200,000 words long. And they send it to me. And I will simply say to them, I'm not even going to look at your book until you cut 35% and send it back to me. Because I can tell you right now, it's just too damn fat. So the lessons I learned as a playwright in terms of economy um, uh, are applicable to writers. Uh, verbs, verbs, verbs. You know, in other kinds of writing, we use adjectives. When you ask a writer to write uh, the pitch for his own book or to write the jacket copy, um, you know, or some sort of a elevator pitch, they're completely at a loss because they're not used to writing adjectives. How, you know, it's very hard to say this stunning, this stunning debut novel by one of the crowning authors of our time. I mean, they get rid of all those adjectives. And, you know, so to go back to them is very hard to do. But one of the advice, piece of advice that I would give to authors is, is okay, write on a word processor. And it's impossible to work these days to work on a typewriter. But when you're finished, print out your manuscript and read it with a, a blue pencil or a pen in hand. And uh, don't, look, don't look at your own manuscript for one to two months. Mm -hmm. Let it cool off. I tell them to put it in the windowsill like a pie and let it get cold. And then look at your, your manuscript when it's ice cold and you'll be appalled at how uh, bloated it is. And that's, that's when you'll know how to cut. But most authors are so hot to get the manuscript out of their computer and over to their agents that they send it to me and they're so hurt and insulted when I tell them how bloated it is. And some of them want to leave me and, you know, um, and they grudgingly go back all right, I'll look at the manuscript, but it's perfect. And about six months later, I'll get it back with an apology saying how right I was. And, you know, but how many authors can control themselves and not get the manuscript out of there like it's some contaminated, you know, piece of meat that they have to get to dispose of, you know? So, it's hard to do, but it's a, a piece of advice that I'm giving to every author. Let your manuscript cool off and read it as a manuscript in manuscript form. Uh, and that's the way you edit it. Um, so I, I had some short plays, uh, horror plays that were going to be performed um, in the fall of 2020. And then COVID hit and um, uh, I could no longer put those plays on stage. So somebody said to me, why don't you convert them into podcasts or what I call radio plays? Right. So I tried it and, and I did successfully learn that new discipline. And, and talk about um, economy, radio plays or, or podcasts uh, drama is even more economical than stage plays because you don't have stage directions anymore. Um, 
you got to get rid of those. Uh, so it's essentially just people talking, possibly with a narrator that says, the narrator says she crosses the room um, and, and picks up the letter opener. But that, that's it. The rest of it has to be told by people talking to each other with some sound effects. So I learned even more economy from podcast uh, drama than I did from stage plays. Um, and uh, if I can give a, a <laughs> plug to you, Rick, um, uh, I asked uh, Rick's company, Rick, if uh, they wanted to publish those uh, uh, those plays uh, in, in uh, an audiobook, and they did, and I thank you very much. And here's a plug for Tales from the Creepery, which will be made, which will be released generally uh, at the end of October. It's a wonderful series, and I've, I've, I've enjoyed listening to them, and I will also tell you, uh, tell the listeners, that uh, viewers, that I uh, read your play about the closing and laughed out loud numerous times to where my wife is going, you've got to share this with me. Uh, it, it, you're really a marvelous writer. Do, do you, Thank you. Do you prefer, you're welcome. Do, do you prefer writing comedy over drama uh, or do you, do you have a preference one way or the other? I love writing comedy and I've written some, a, a lot of, if I do say so, I, if I do say so myself, I've written a lot of comedy that is so funny that when I read it the 50th time, I still laugh out loud. I believe now, it. <laughs> that's, that is really vain, but um, I think it's a good test of whether you really have written something funny. Um, uh, a lot of the, the things that I write comedically kind of get darker um, as we go along. Um, uh, I, I, I love farce um, and I do too. Uh, uh, but I also like the, 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 the I like witty comedies um, a la Noel Coward, but I also like uh, like the, the, the darker stuff as well. A, a fairly well-known playwright, uh, I had lunch with him a couple of years ago and he said, you know, I'm a good writer, but I don't know how to write comedy. What is the secret of writing comedy? And I said, you have to be silly. You have to learn how to be silly. And I said to him, you're not a silly person. <laughs> so don't write any comedy. But when you think about uh, most comedies from Shakespeare to Gilbert and Sullivan, the situations are nonsense. It's nonsense. And if you have an ear and an eye uh, and a, a taste for nonsense and silliness, then you, you'll write good comedy. Um, I don't know if you've ever read S.J. Perlman, but he was probably the wittiest uh, kind of role model for me because he was so urbane and educated. He was like an Oxford Don, but he had the silliest sense of humor you could possibly imagine. <laughs> so if anybody wants to be a good, witty um, comedy writer, read Perlman, P-E-R-E-L-M-A-N. Great. So speaking of comedy and other writers, um, there's a British comedy writer also named Richard Curtis. And I'm wondering if you ever get mistaken for each other. And if so, have there been any humorous anecdotes that came out of well, that? This is my nemesis. Okay? <laughs> um, I have written him from time to time saying, listen, about the name, I had it first. And <laughs> just in case he ever wants to sue me or plant the flag, <laughs> um, uh, I had the name first. And I was a writer before he was. But uh, he is a brilliant writer. He wrote uh, Love Actually, um, Four Weddings and a Funeral. Um, uh, he's a producer, writer. Uh, his website is like 80 pages long. 
Wow. And, and my website, you can't even find it on Wikipedia um, because they rejected. I said, I think I'm fairly well known. And they said, basically, you're not well known enough. So I'm not even on Wikipedia, uh, not for want of trying. <laughs> but from time to time, I would get a, an offer for that Richard Curtis. I called him the good Richard Curtis as opposed to me. Um, I got contract. I once got a check uh, for him uh, that I had to return. Um, and once, uh, from time to time, I would get a fan letter uh, for him. I forward them to his agent. But once I got a fan letter that was so touching that I, I just was worried that he would not get it or answer it. So I answered as him and I, I thanked her. I'm so glad that I was able to help you through a difficult time. And I hope she's not listening <laughs> because it was the, the other Richard Curtis, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. You know, I, it was a mitzvah. It was a mitzvah. Yeah. It's funny. I had a somewhat similar experience in that um, the photo editor of Penthouse Magazine was named Richard Blyweiss. And really? I would occasionally get calls from his models and, and thinking I was he. And it, it, they were quite interesting calls, actually. I'll bet they were. <laughs> but and it's neither here nor there. So no, it is. Uh, let me ask you, going back to agenting for a second, what do you like about being an agent? What do you not like about being an agent? <laughs> I am a very hands-on agent. Um, I'm very tough on writers. Um, first of all, because I'm very tough. And second of all, because the market is even crueler than I am. Um, <laughs> I sometimes think, that I care more about your book than I care about you um, because I, I, I'm i willing sometimes to go to the wall um, to defend what I believe is my opinion of what's wrong with your book. And as I say, sometimes I've, I've had writers very upset with me, um, but uh, I love the hands-on process to the point where instead of saying your book, I call it our book. Like this is, this is what we're gonna do. Um, uh, this is what we should do. Uh, as if I'm more of a collaborator than, uh, than somebody consulting with you. Um, uh, and I, I like to feel that authors like the collaborative process. Um, and I, I, you know, when they finally stop being mad at me, um, I've had, I have a whole room full of books dedicated to me and acknowledging me and thanking me without which I could not have done this. And so ultimately it's gratifying. Somebody came back to me after 20 years saying, I, I was wrong. <laughs> So, you know, uh, that was very gratifying. Yeah. What I hate about agenting today um, is the submission process, which has, uh, which was growing long anyway. Um, I mean, I could, I have in my writing, my blogs and my books, I've chronicled the history of modern publishing. Um, and we have really evolved from, a, from a, a, a business when I came into it that was run by a single man or woman who made the decisions, the buck stopped with him or her, and, uh, and they would basically say, uh, I don't like this book, but if you have faith in it, we'll buy it. Or this book is messed up, but we'll, we'll buy it and we'll fix it up. Um, that was then, but as the business became more corporate, um, you basically had re these, these single leaders replaced by what I, I can only describe as middle management 
uh, editors who were very concerned about their jobs and, um, and all sorts of hierarchy of, of bureaucracy and consensual decisions made on books and committee meetings and, um, uh, and all sorts of delays uh, and unfairnesses in the deliberation process. Um, and that was even before COVID. When COVID hit, uh, all of the authors, uh, excuse me, editors retreated to their homes mm -hmm. and the deliberation process became even more extended um, as editors um, were cut off from each other, uh, uh, had to learn how to Zoom conference over books that were submitted to them. Um, but the process uh, became so attenuated and so complex and so fraught with indecision um, and with rejection because what you have uh, in a bureaucratic situation um, such as many publishers have become is it's easier to say no than to say yes. You don't wanna be responsible for saying yes to a book that ends up losing $200,000. So it's easier to say no to a book on which you leave, you might lose $10,000. Um, um, uh, and, and, and that's part of it. So basically that part of it is, is the part of it that I really hate. And there are some days when I hate it so much I wanna kill. So what? So watch out, Rick. <laughs> All right. Okay. Just I, want, I want fast decisions on my books. Forewarned. You know, that leads me to a question. Um, on social media, I, I deal with a lot of aspiring authors and writers. And one of the complaints that they have is that uh, when, they, when they send in manuscripts, they often don't get uh, they don't get responses, or they, if they do, they don't get reasons, they just get rejections. And I'm wondering, as an agent, when you submit to a publisher who doesn't buy your book, do they give you reasons why they're not buying it, or is it the same process where it's just we're not buying it? Um, any book that I, I'm just talking about me now. Yeah, just any book that Any book that I take on is a book that I feel passionately about because I feel I can't take on anything less than a book that I'm crazy about. Okay. Now, you may think that you may not like the book, but you're not going to reject it saying, what the hell were you thinking of, Curtis? You're going to say, if the decision was 5149 against, um, uh, and, and you will give me a couple of lines of excuse, explanation. Right. Some of it, some of it is boilerplate. Uh, we just don't think we can make money on right. your on this manuscript, or it's not what we're buying now. Um, but if it gets a respectful reading, you will know from the, the text of of the rejection email. Um, uh, if I don't get any answer at all, I will send an occasional reminder. And if I don't get an answer after knocking my head against the wall a few times, I'll just basically withdraw the book right. and move on or go to another pub editor at that same publishing company because I'll just assume that they haven't even opened the email. Got it. I'm not blaming editors. They're overwhelmed these days. Um, plus, being at home, many of them are parents yeah. uh, and have uh, a devil's own time, you know, keeping up, you know. But from the viewpoint of an, of an agent, it is frustrating. If, if you, as an author, don't get a response from an, edit, an agent or an editor, including myself, um, because I don't have a rejection slip uh, email. Um, 
if you don't hear from somebody, just move on. Just assume, um, just assume. One of the mistakes a lot of authors make is they submit multiply, which is okay, but they, I'm able to see the CCs to every agent in the industry. Got it. So don't do that. Um, just send it to yourself so that and see, blind CC me. So it looks like I'm the only one getting the submission. I know how the game is played. I know you. I know I'm not the only agent. Although many times I will get a flattering email, you know, that says that since you are one of the sublime agents <laughs> of all time, um, I thought of you for this book. But that, that's okay. I mean, you got to get your foot in the door. Yep. But but if you don't get an answer, just move on or adjust your pitch. Um, a lot of email pitches are wrong for so many reasons. I, I almost can't begin to explain what they are. There are plenty of books that tell you how to, how to pitch your book. From my viewpoint, um, uh, the shorter, the better. Um, uh, what impresses me most, I think, is your credentials, if you have any. If you're a nonfiction writer, the first thing I want to know is, in what way are you an authority? Right. And how is the book that you are writing, or the book that you have written, how is that book different from whatever's out there in the field? That will certainly get my attention. If you are a novelist, um, and you've had books published by a traditional publisher, um, I will certainly want to know that. Um, a lot of um, authors will say have had six books published and uh, hoping that I won't check out those books. Don't bother. I mean, you can say I've had them published on Amazon or I've self-published them, but any agent who is interested enough in you is going to go online go to Amazon and see immediately that you self-publish those books. Don't be ashamed to say I self-published them because you can say, yes, I self-published them, but I think this book is ready for the big time. Um, I feel very good about it. Uh, my career, um, my writing skills have blossomed. I found my voice. Please have a look at it. And here is a two-line uh, elevator pitch. I am not a big fan of, of something meets something else, um, which is this, you know, has become this epidemic of pitching. Um, you know, gone with the gone with the wind meets war and peace, whatever it may be. Right, um, got it. I, I, to me, that's really a cheap way of of expressing your, and if you can't really find the adjectives and adverbs to describe a book that you love, uh, instead saying, you know, that it's, it's like war and peace, then I, I'm not sure you believe enough in your book. Now, that's just me, but all the other agents, so many other agents are from the, you know, this book is like when Sally, meets Irving, right. and, uh, you know, it, it's fine. It's not, it's just not, it doesn't impress me. Got it. And it's not, it's not a technique uh, that I use. Cool, I, I get it, believe me. Um, so do you have any opinion on using pen names? Uh, I'm a big fan of pen names. Really? Um, I well, I wrote dirty books under a pen name. <laughs> okay. Um, I I wrote what may be my most my most successful book under a pen name. I wrote the the novelization of the original Halloween movie, Halloween One. Oh wow! Um, and I was engaged as a writer for hire to write the novelization of Halloween, um, and I wrote it under the 
pen name of Curtis Richards, which is fairly <laughs> fairly transparent. Um, uh, that book is no longer available for whatever reason. The producers who own the rights have never re-released that book. Uh, if you want to buy it, it'll set you back six or seven hundred dollars. Um, but if you visit that book on Amazon, you will see uh, hundreds of five-star reviews um, because the book is better than the movie. Wow. Uh, uh, the, the book explains things that are left unexplained in the movie. And there's plenty unexplained in that movie. I actually had to create um, a reason for um, uh, for somebody, uh, for instance, I had to explain a reason why the guy, this killer, uh, learned how to drive when he was basically institutionalized for 20 years. Um, uh, I had to invent uh, a, a reason why, after being shot six times by a 375 Magnum um, at point blank range, he doesn't die. You're right. um, so in the middle of the movie, I said to myself, he must, this must be supernatural. <laughs> so I had to write a supernatural explanation of a movie that was not supernatural. Well, everybody who reads the book and writes a comment on Amazon says, at last, I understand, I understand what was going on in the movie. Um, and I have to say, from what I'm told, that um, subsequent Halloween movies have used some of that stuff that I invented. That's very um, cool. I've learned a lot about you. I did not know, and I thought I know you fairly well. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so, well, anyway. So, yes, I'm a big believer in pen names because many authors are prolific. Um, and uh, I grew up in an era when people could write two books a month um, and a publisher couldn't publish two books a month. So they would basically, the authors would, would write one series for publisher A under name A and one public series for publisher B under name B. And publisher A never knew what publisher B was publishing the same author. Um, and uh, so for prolific authors uh, or authors who write in two different genres, um, you know, Nora Roberts or uh, some other authors that you can think of, um, they have a name that is suitable to that particular particular genre. Right. Um, also, for some authors whose careers have gone into what is called the death spiral. The death spiral means that your first novel sold 100,000 copies, your second novel sold 50,000 copies, and your third novel sold 5,000 copies. Now, if I submit your book under your name to an editor, they're going to see that information yeah. and they're going to say, this, this author is heading for the, for the toilet bowl. <laughs> and so that's a case for pen name. So I will send the author's next book under a pseudonym and I will say to an editor, this book is by an author with a sub considerable track record um, <coughs> who's written a, this book under a pen name. But sometimes I won't tell them it's a pen name at all. I'll just send it and hope that they will discover it as a first novel. Now, if they do, and they say, this is terrific, then the question is, well, how can we promote this person under a pen name? And then I'll say, well, his real name or her real name is and would you rather publish the pen name or the real name? And sometimes they will, and sometimes they won't. Um, but there are all kinds of things you can do with pen names 
So uh, yes, I'm a great believer in pseudonyms. Great. Richard, we're running out of time. We're toward the end. And I was wondering if you could share what your number one tip for aspiring writers is. I'll give you two tips. I'll give you three. Um, one is use verbs. The second one is the one that I gave before, which is put your manuscript away when you finish it, look at it when it's ice cold, look at it as a printout and edit it as a printout. Number three, show, don't tell. That's part of the economy of being a writer is uh, as soon as I hear um, that they found a corpse, uh, I wanna know, I wanna see that corpse being, that person being murdered. Right. Uh, if you just tell me they found a corpse, that that's heading to be a cozy, Manu a cozy novel. Um, I want to see the sleuth being attacked. Uh, I don't want. I don't want to hear that. That after the attack, he went to his office. All that stuff. Show, don't tell. And my final advice to authors is: learn how to spell forward. <laughs> because fifty percent, fifty percent of the authors who submit their books to me. Spell forward, F O R W A R D. Now, if if that if the first word that an agent or an editor reads is misspelled, how do you think they're going to feel about the rest of your book? <laughs> so please, F O R E W O R D. And Great. that's my last. That's my last word. W O R D. <laughs> Richard, this has been marvelous. I've really enjoyed hearing about everything you've talked about today. And I hope everybody listening uh, enjoyed it as well when they, when they watch this. And, and for everybody out there, um, if you did enjoy this, um, please do press my logo and subscribe to the channel because there'll be other wonderful future chapter and verse episodes that I believe you'll probably find, well, maybe not as interesting as Richard's, but very interesting. Richard, everybody, everybody in publishing is interesting. If you just have to ask the interesting question, which you have done. So thank you and thank everybody for tuning in. Great. Thanks, Richard. Good. Okay. Bye. Adios. <laughs>